So now we pray. Living God, what do you want us to hear? What do you want us to know? What do you want us to feel? How do you want to change us as we gather around your word this morning? Open our eyes, the eyes of our hearts. Open our ears, the ears of our hearts. To see you and to hear you, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so we've thought about Jacob on his way to a confrontation with Esau. And one of the interesting details in the Genesis account of Jacob is that he gets his name because he's a cheat and a trickster. He's a twin. And it says in this very vivid story of his birth that he's born holding on to his brother's heel as he comes out of the womb. Um, as a man, he cheated his brother out of his father's blessing. Monty Python fans will remember my brother Esau is a hairy man, but I am a smooth man. Back then, people's names meant something. Go and look it up on Google or YouTube if you're too young to remember that. People's names meant something. And Jacob's name means that he's a trickster or a, a cheat. And so we've heard some of the backstory to today's scripture reading which today is not a mystical dream with a vision of angels ascending and descending, is not a tragic comedy where he is tricked into marrying the wrong sister, the one he didn't fancy initially. Today's story is stranger and it's darker. It's a story about someone getting attacked. We meet Jacob on his way back home his way to an encounter with Esau, and he comes to the river Jabbok, and he sends his family on ahead along with everything he has, and they cross over, and Jacob stays behind. He stays behind on his own as the darkness falls. So, I wonder what his night prayer was. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. You see, if you're serious about this story and about reading this story, this is when the room goes a bit quiet because we're faced with two of the things that we are most afraid of, that people are most afraid of, being on our own and then being on our own in the dark. And here where he is at his most vulnerable in the night which is full of shadows and strange noises, Jacob is attacked. Someone jumps him and he has to start wrestling with them. And we're not told who it is, just that it is a man and that Jacob wrestles with him all night long. It is a long and an exhausting struggle and Jacob feels as though he is fighting for his life and he hangs on for dear life and he refuses to submit. And when the man sees that he can't beat him and that he's not getting the better of him, he strikes him on the hip, putting his leg out of joint. And here, as Jacob is wounded in the struggle, something very strange happens. The two wrestlers stop for a moment, as if they are both exhausted. They stop, but they won't let go of each other. And as they stand there hanging on to each other, they have a conversation, and the attacker says, Let me go, because the day is breaking. What does Jacob say? We might expect him to say, what do you mean let me go? You started this, but he doesn't. He says, 
I won't let you go unless you bless me. I won't let you go. I won't let you go until you bless me. And here, perhaps, we have a problem, a bit like the one we had with names. When we say bless you, it's because maybe someone sneezed, or it's a bit like saying have a nice day. But in the Hebrew Bible, when uh, you are looking for a blessing, it means something much deeper than that. It means that you're given something which will make a huge difference to your life, some kind of assurance that things are going to go well with you, a kind of protective promise that the force is going to be with you. But the problem is, how on earth does this attack, this rough mugging, this painful, bruising, exhausting struggle, how does it turn into a situation where Jacob wants something from the person that he's been struggling with? If we go back to their conversation, the man says to Jacob, what's your name? And he says, Jacob. And the stranger says something remarkable. Your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Because you have wrestled with God and with men, and you have won. Israel means in Hebrew, the one who struggles with God. Not to be outdone, Jacob then says, well, what's your name then? But the stranger just says, why are you asking that? And then he blesses him. Jacob, the story then tells us, has been wrestling with God. It's been a struggle with God, Jacob's struggle. And now there's one more name change that comes because Jacob says, well, I'm going to call this place where we are Peniel. Peniel, Peniel, the face of God. I have seen God face to face and I've lived to tell the tale. If you ever go to Cornwall, there's wee uh, villages there um, with chapels in them called Peniel. Um, and then finally, there's one last scene from our western riding off as earth's morning breaks, as the sun comes up. Only Jacob doesn't ride off. He walks away limping because of his bad hip which was hurt in the fight. Alone in the darkness, with a river to cross, a wrestling match, walking away wounded, a new name, a blessing, and a new dawn. This, sisters and brothers, is a big story. The invitation to live as Christians is an invitation to live within what Karl Barth called the strange new world of the Bible. It's an invitation to read the stories of your life and my life in the light of the stories of God's people in the Scriptures. I spent part of this summer in Paris working as the locum minister for the Scots Kirk there. And when I told people that, they would wink and they would say, nice work if you can get it. And I am not immune to the charms of Paris, but I'm also old enough to know, as Michael Stipe once sang, that everybody hurts. And so it was, I ended up not simply going down the Seine on the Bateau Mouche, but working in one of the most complicated and distressing pastoral situations of the whole of my ministry woman in the prime of life, terminally ill, and a little person who's just been left behind this week. She died two days ago, a little person left behind with no obvious person to care for them or parent them. And in the hospital, on the banks of the Seine, on a baking hot day, her friend who was holding way too many things together with not enough support, turned to me and said, I shouldn't say this to you, but I'm so angry with God. And I said, no, you should say it to me. I remember saying in a funeral sermon for a dear, dear friend of mine who also died young and who also left two very little people behind, never trust a Christian who doesn't struggle with God. They don't know themselves and they don't know their Bible, 
And actually today I would go so far as to say they don't really know God at all either. And of course in European societies today and in societies like Scotland the temptation is to say when we're facing the difficult things in life this struggle is too much, it's absurd, it's unbearable, I'm not going to do it, I'm going to give up on the idea of God and faith and church altogether. And I have a lot of sympathy with people who do that, particularly when it's a response to suffering. The trouble is that if you throw out the old stories, whether they're the stories of Jacob or of Job or of Jesus, suffering is still there in the world. Cruelty is still there in the world. Violence is still there in the world. Trauma and abuse are still there. Cancer is still there. War is still there. And I see no evidence at all that those things are any easier to deal with if you're an atheist or agnostic. It matters, I think, how we have learned our Christian faith. If we are going to hold on to God in the dark times and in the darkest times, we have to be prepared to struggle and prepared for struggle. And to read the scriptures as we've done this morning is to discover it has always been like that for God's people. Not we believe because God wants to give us a hard time, but because the presence of evil and suffering in the world is a stubborn and a mysterious thing. And I am not ordained and you are not baptized into a church of easy answers. And the good news is not come to Jesus and your struggles will all be over. The good news is that in Jesus somehow we believe God comes to struggle alongside us. And in the face of Jesus we see a God who will not let go of us. And in Jesus we even see in Gethsemane's garden and on the cross a struggle which reaches into the very life of God. And maybe when we evangelize in the church, our evangelism should be more like that of Jesus who says, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus who says, in this world you will have trouble. Maybe the Alpha Course should have a struggle weekend as well as a Holy Spirit weekend in it. You see, people who walk into this building and see it as a bright and airy and warm community facility, that's fantastic. But they're only getting half of the story if that's all they see, because the truth is that this is first and foremost a wrestling arena. This place is built for wrestling with God. And it's a place, therefore, where you can get wounded, but it's also a place where you can get blessed. And it's a place where some of us hang on to God and faith by our fingernails and fingernails that are bitten down as well. But it's also a place where we believe that God has hung on to us. It's a place where we've found out who we were, where we've been fed and blessed and held and helped. It's Peniel in Langside where we've seen the face of God and lived. The old hymn calls us to wrestle and fight and pray. And our gospel reader reading reminded us, didn't it, that prayer is not just about peace and calm and quiet and mindful breathing, although sometimes it's about all of those things and they're all great. But to pray sometimes looks like a widow who keeps coming day after day to a cynical and heartless judge and on Monday she comes and says, give me justice. And on Tuesday she comes and says, give me justice. And on Wednesday, give me justice. And on Thursday, give me justice. And on by Friday, Jesus says he's so fed up with her that he gives her justice. It's one of Jesus' how much more stories. If this can happen just through persistence, how much more will God bring justice? God's face, Jesus says, is easier to look at and speak to than that of a cynical, corrupt judge. So don't lose faith and don't give up and don't let go. Yes, there will be times when it gets dark. There will be lonely times. Yes, this is the deal, that there will be wrestling. Yes, there will be all the things that we sing about in Abide With Me, clouds and shadows, temptations and ills and tears. Yes, there will be death to face and there will be graves to stand beside. And yes, we will limp away from life or from church sometimes, wounded by the struggle of doing this. 
But we keep coming back to this place because we believe it's a place where we come and we say to God, as the people of God together, we will not let you go until you bless us. At this table, at the font, we have the cross held before us and we say that however dark the night is, we believe it is not going to last forever. And however honest we are about facing the difficulties of the human condition, we do not believe that evil is going to have the last word or that violence will have the last word or that suffering will have the last word. We believe both for this life and for the next that sometimes heaven's morning can break in and bring a new dawn. And in eternity we believe that one day every shadow will be driven away. This is a building built for wrestling in, but it's also a building built for praying and for hoping and for blessing. So may God bless you. Never trust a Christian who doesn't struggle with God. May God bless you in your struggles And may you live to see the sun rising, even if you're walking away wounded. Amen.